Okay, so I see we have a couple of persons joining us um, this evening. Um, so I can see about 12 participants on the call. So is it okay for us to just um, let us know where we're joining in from? So I'm joining in from Abuja and um, what's my emotions here? I feel excited. I'm happy to uh, be joining the very first webinar series on um, the Eco Anxiety Project. Um, so I'd like for us to hear, I'd like for us to um, just briefly introduce ourselves. We could use the chat box, just let us know where you're joining in from and um, how you're feeling at the moment. And just let us know the state of um, what the climate is. At, um, <laughs> your, it's sunny at my um, location, so it's really hot. It's sunny, and um, but I think I like my current view. So, we can unmute and speak, it's fine. This is a safe space, please. I can see Jennifer smiling, so maybe they would like to hear from you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chikadi. Um, yeah, I am fine. I'm calling from, I'm joining from Lagos, Nigeria. And yes, it's also very hot, really, really temperate weather, really hot. And in terms of emotions, I think I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired, it's been a very long week, but I'm also very you know, excited about our very first webinar, this conversation, and where it's potentially lead. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Charles. Um, sorry, we're putting you on the spot. Well, let's hear from you. How, how is it at your end? How do you feel? Hi, yes, yeah, sorry. I actually just posted in the um, chat box. So I'm very excited, actually, to be joining you guys. So I was just um, saying to Jennifer before uh, we started um, that this is very exciting for me because I've been working on climate anxiety um, for a while now. And this is, I'm going to say, the first time that I've I'm in a forum where I'm talking to other Africans about this. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, unfortunately, the weather is not nothing to be excited about where I am. It's very windy and very wet, and it's just kind of miserable. So, um, but other than that, um, I think there, in terms of the in terms of the the climate, more broadly speaking, there is. Um, I love, I feel very optimistic. I feel um, very um, enthused um, to be, you know, um, alongside other people um, who, are, who are trying to make sense of this situation. And I think, yeah, there's a lot of strength to kind of draw from that. So that's, that's where I'm, that's how I'm feeling right now. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm like kind of jumping protocols, like I, I haven't introduced anybody yet. I just want us to go ahead and speak. Yeah, so I can see a couple of persons dropping comments in the chat box. Yeah, okay, someone said, um, I can't hear you saying, can you all now hear? Okay, so on the slide, and it means that we, we are hearing. That's fine. Okay, this person says, um, Hawa. My name is Hawa. I'm joining in from Ilori. Windy and sunny. It's sunny and windy at, windy at the same time, but I'm happy to be here. Great to have you, Hawa. So I'm joining from Finland. Okay, this is Palmo joining from Finland as well, and I'm excited to be here. You're welcome, Pamela. Sorry I can't read through all of the comments, but thank you for dropping in your chat. Thank you for um, joining in. I mean, this is the very first webinar series on the Eco Anxiety Project, and um, we are also excited to be um, having this very first webinar series. We are trusting that it will be a whole lot of um, insightful discussion, and there will be lots to learn from. Uh, with have two amazing speakers with us, but we would not waste so much of our time. So um, I would just, we have, we currently have um, the two speakers here, but I wouldn't go into their profile just yet. But basically, see, I would just like to say that um, the Eco Anxiety um, Project is all about um, helping us understand the, um, the interconnectedness of the um, climate and then the environment and just having to have those discussions about it. I mean, eco-anxiety is a new concept, so to speak, but it's not like it's completely big. It's not like it's not something that is in existence. It is very much in existence. And then that is what we are coming here. That is why we're here today. 
And then I would just like to um, briefly say that we could please use um, the tweet. So the hashtag for this um, very webinar series is um, tip um, webinar. So you could just hashtag tip. I will drop it in the comment session. So I will drop um, the hashtag, right? So we can just you know go ahead and tweet and let people know that this is what is happening. And it's the very first um, webinar. Right, just a moment, please. Okay. So um, while we commence this um, discussion this evening, so I would like for us to have, by the way, my name is Chiko Duzumaka. I'm one of the project managers and for Susti Vibes. I, I forgot to mention that, yes, I'm Chiko Duzumaka, one of the project managers for Susti Vibes. I'm a volunteer with Susti Vibes Act as well. And um, there's not so much about to read. I, I think I'll go with that. So our first speaker for this um, evening will be, Dr. Charles, um, can we all just maybe just drop an emoji in the comments, let him know that he's very much welcome. So good to have you, um, Dr. Charles, on this very um, conversation. Um, just Thank very you. briefly, yes, so just very briefly, I'll be reading out his bio. Just very quickly, while um, I call him up. So Dr. Charles Obumbode is an assistant pro professor in applied psychology at the University of Nottingham, UK. His research investigates how personal experiences, um, information, exposure, and social norms shapes, sorry, how social norms shapes um, the way people engage with the environment, with the environmental problems. He also studies environmental he also studies how environmental engagement, defined as the sum of our beliefs, actions, emotions, and tendencies regarding environmental issues, relates to mental health and well being. He has completed a first degree in wildlife, in wildlife management at the University of Ibadan, and a PhD in psychology at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. So, um, he will be the first speaker who will be taking us on understanding eco-anxiety and environmental related um, emotions. So, Dr. Charles, so good to have you here. You're welcome. Um, Thank you. Please um, just proceed. I'll keep quiet at this point in time. Meanwhile, while he speaks, I would like for us to also, you know, you know, have our pens down and just a couple of things. So if you have questions, this is a new field we are trying to explore. So if you have questions, you could as well drop it in the chat, chat box or either send a DM or something, but we'll be curating your questions so that we'll treat this um, while we have our question and answer session. So over to you, Dr. Charles. Thank you very much. Um, and please, um, yes, I, I just want to reiterate that the um, purpose of this is, um, I, I think there's very much as much for me to learn from speaking with you today um, as there is for me to share from my exploration of the topic so far. Um, I think you're very right in saying it's very much a new construct that we're trying to make sense of. Um, and so this is a valuable learning experience for me in terms of just trying to um, um, get some insights into how other people experience this. So I've got a few slides I'm just going to try to uh, I'll try to go through um, fairly quickly and the um, the point of them really is just to kind of set up what I hope will be um, a very interactive exchange um, um, further on um, in the uh, event today. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, my research mainly, um, I look at climate anxiety, which is kind of a subset of eco-anxiety. So you can think about eco-anxiety, so the broader set of emotions that we have around um, the ecological crisis as a whole. Climate change is a part of that, but there's also things like biodiversity loss, there, there's you know, what's going on with the oceans, there's the plastic pollution problem, the whole variety of segments to it, uh, or subsets to it, if you like. But I've mainly focused on climate change in my, um, in my, in my, in my work so far. So just a quick um, sort of background, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm, I'm sure everyone who's present here is already aware of this, but basically global temperatures are rising. Um, 
I, have, uh, I think current estimates are that global temperatures are rising at about 0.2 degrees or something um, every decade. Now, that doesn't really sound like a lot, but the knock on effects for the climate overall and the, and the impacts in, on our economy and health and the natural environment are really profound. Um, and it's, um, you know, an issue that we really need to address, um, you know, urgently um, because it's, it's essentially sort of encapsulates any aspect we can think of in terms of what we need to survive as a species on this planet is affected by um, climate change. And to uh, a large extent, I mean, there's you know, a fairly firm consensus amongst um, scientists that um, you know, the main drivers of climate change um, are, are related to human activity. And some of the, the, the key domains are um, in, to come from you know, how we use energy. So use of fossil fuels are contributing greenhouse gases which are um, leading to temperature rises. We also have um, impacts from agriculture. So the way we produce our food um, is a key part of that, as well as um, land use practice, the deforestation. So we're, we're essentially changing the, 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 the um, planet in such a way that it's making the climate un, in, um, inhospitable um, for ourselves. Now, um, up till very recently, um, when thinking about the impacts that climate change or the implications that climate change has for humanity as a whole, the emphasis has always been on things like the economic impacts, so the like physical health impacts and things like that. People haven't really um, thought that much about the psychological impacts, and that's part of the reason why the subtitle for my talk today is about you know how do we thrive in this. Um, in this age of ecological crisis, because those economic impacts and the fiscal health impacts of, you know, as I've been the focus before now, I think kind of capture what we need to survive. But, but it's not just enough to survive. You know, you can survive and have a very miserable existence. We want to be able to do more than that. We want to actually thrive. And that's where the questions around well-being and mental health come in. You know, how do we have a life that is meaningful, that's fulfilling, um, that a life that we, you know, that's worth living um, in this planet, um, not just now, but into the future. And that's where some of the key questions for me, certainly around the psychological issues um, kind of come up. So if we look at the psychological impacts of climate change very broadly, and um, they're divided into three categories. So there's some that come from some of the direct impacts of climate change. So like extreme weather events of heat and drought and you know, both sort of um, gradual changes in the in land, so like changing seasons, for example, that have impacts for say, our agricultural productivity, all that kind of stuff. They have implications for our mental health as well. People feel displaced. People feel, um, for example, like so nostalgia is one of the concepts that's kind of come off um, this area where essentially the landscape around you changes so much that it's it's unrecognizable. It's almost like you've moved to a different place, even though you're still in the same place. And those those are linked to sort of this direct impacts. There are also the psychosocial impacts, which we can think of as sort of the secondary stresses, sort of. So, say for example, you've got a very serious drought that occurs in a place, and people are forced to migrate as a result because they can no longer have meaningful livelihoods in that area. There are the knock-on effects for our psychology that come from that. So, th those first two categories have received quite a lot of attention, but the 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 uh, third dimension, uh, which is this so-called direct Im indirect impacts, the Sexual impacts, which is where uh, concepts like eco anxiety fall into, uh, relatively new. We haven't really had much attention to those, um, um, but they're really important, particularly when we think about things like um, eco anxiety and climate anxiety. And this basically is linked to this idea that you don't have to be directly affected by a flood or a heat wave or a drought to be impacted by climate change. Just the mere knowledge of the magnitude of change that's going on in the world right now can evoke a level of stress and um, Emotional, emotional distress to the point that it has implications or a negative impact on your well-being and mental health. And um, th that's encapsulated within the concept of eco-anxiety and climate anxiety. And I'm particularly interested in those concepts because I would argue that those are possibly the most pervasive channels by which climate anxiety, uh, sorry, by which climate change impacts people because th there's, no, there's no boundary. The only requirement to be affected by it is that you know of climate change, that's it. Um, so for that reason, I think it's really important and it's relevant to everyone wherever um, you are. Okay, so just a quick um, background of how I got to um, this point of um, uh, being interested in, uh, um, in, in, in climate anxiety. So much of my research before now has been around the topic of climate change engagement, which basically um, very, very um, sort of, uh, simply defined captures um, what people know about climate change, the degree to which they care about it, 
and how motivated they are to act. So the research has always been about trying to identify the factors that promote engagement with climate change amongst the public. So for a long time, we had this impression that, look, the public are just disengaged. People just think it's a distant issue, doesn't really affect them, or it's you know happening somewhere else, or it's gonna be in the future, or something like that. So then the, 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 the general understanding in academia anyway was that look, we really need to drive this issue home, um, home for people. Now, the core part of that that's relevant uh, to this talk today is the caring aspect, caring about the issue. That's what really captures that emotional engagement. So from a psychological perspective, we think about relationships, emotions, and behavior as emotions are kind of like the engine for behavior. You know, you only respond to something that you feel concerned about. You only respond to something that you feel um, that, that kind of engages your emotions, right? So if something is if it worries you or, in, or, or, or triggers fear or anxiety or things like that, then that emotion draws your attention to that issue. And as humans, we're usually really strongly motivated to neutralize any sources of worry or concern and things like that. So the idea was, how do we make climate change that for people? So they see it as something that they have to act to do something about. And if we look at data coming from all over the world, so I've got two um, large studies uh, that were conducted very recently here. Um, so the first, the, the panel to the left kind of shows um, data for us, uh, shows data from the uh, a global study that was done by the Pew Research Center in the US. And you can see there that, you know, people from all different countries across the world recognize that climate change is a threat to them. So if we look at just focusing on the African countries here, there's um, South Africa, uh, sorry, there's Kenya, where about 71% of people think that climate change is a major threat to their country. Then there's South Africa, where there's about 59%, and Nigeria, where there's about 41% of people that say, you know, climate change is a major threat to their country. So a, a good proportion of people recognize the threat. And then when we move to the panel on the right, that's data from 2021, which is collected by the uh, Climate Change Communication Project in collaboration with Facebook. Uh, so they gathered this data from, I think, 31 countries around the world. And here we also have some representation of African countries. And we've got um, uh, South Africa here again with 54% of people saying they're very worried about climate change and Nigeria with 41% of people. So these are large samples that are so, right, representative of these countries, right? So definitely, um, I would say at this point that we can argue that there is a good level of engagement with the issue um, in in Africa. People recognize the importance and people are worried about it. Well, here's where the challenge then comes in terms of how we how we think about what this engagement means. Because you know, emotions, um, I was just focusing on worry for now. Uh, worry doesn't only motivate people to act. You know, worry can have other other impacts as well beyond um, motivating people to act. And particularly in 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 relation to climate change, we need to be more. Um, uh, we have to develop a more nuanced understanding of the role of emotions. So, you know, with the the the, the kinds of context in which the theories, for example, that I've been working with were developed were in relation to. Um, um, risks and issues that were relatively individualized that people could just kind of take in, um, action individually to resolve. So these would be things like financial um, financial threats, financial risk or health threats, things like that. So it could be something like, well, say, for example, the threat is something like uh, obesity or um, breast cancer or something like that. Then you as an individual, if you're worried about it, you can take some action, you can go and get a screening done or you can decide to get some exercise done or something, and that kind of directly addresses that problem. But climate change is not a problem like that. Climate change is a much bigger problem. You know, your individual action, you do a bit more, you recycle more, you eat organic food, you fly less, you stop using plastic straws, you do whatever it is. I mean, all of those in individual actions, yes, they do add up to, uh, you know, significant impact overall if sufficient numbers of people um, get involved with them. But we don't always see what's happening elsewhere. We don't always see the magnitude of, you know, how many people are actually acting. We don't, we don't really know. So because it, the problem is so enormous and because also um, it, there's, a, there's a time lag between what we do and when the impacts occur. So for example, even if we cut back on all, we cut back all emissions to zero today, there's still impacts that are baked in that are still gonna be occurring for a few decades before we begin to see any real sort of like change and things like that. So it just means the problem is, the, is something where it's very easy for your level of concern or your level of worry to exceed your perceived effectiveness to address the issue. 
Um, and that's where the problem sets in because um, um, worry functions as a motivation for action when you feel, when you believe that what you're doing is going to have an impact. But when you don't have that faith that's going to have an impact, or when it doesn't seem like, or at least the evidence for the impact is not so clear to you, then it can spill over into maladaptive responses like mental health impacts or you know sort of undermining your um your your well-being you start to ruminate on it and that's where things like climate anxiety kind of set in and we've seen that there's a lot of evidence for climate anxiety being important particularly amongst young people around the world but i don't think it's limited to young people by any means at all um, and i'll come to that um later on so we see that you know, worry gets so intense amongst people to the degree that people, um, you know, they just lose optimism about the future. They um, suffer disruptions in their sleep. Uh, they, 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 they're unable to enjoy things that they used to take joy in, like their social relations with other people and things like that. And so we, we basically, we need a strategy for responding to climate change that is not just about um, promoting action and motivating people to act, but also protecting people's mental health. You know, this, this I like to think about in the sense that we, we can think about it as a campaign, basically, which is going to be going on for a long time. So how do we support people to be able to carry on in that campaign without burning out? And those are the kinds of issues that um, we kind of need to address within um, this concept of climate change. Okay, so I, if you pardon me for a minute, this is just, this is going to get a bit technical for a few slides, but hopefully we'll, we'll navigate it and uh, I'll, I'll be able to get the message across. So basically I'll show you a set of panels. This is the first panel. And what I want to draw attention to here is, so this is a study I conducted uh, with a bunch of colleagues is currently in, well, in the process of getting published. And I'll just show you some of the key results from that. So what this graph here is showing is the relationship between negative emotions people have about climate change in different countries of the 28 countries we've gathered data from here and the relationship with mental well-being. So the broken line at the top there, which reads zero, um, basically means like if, if those bars cross that line, it means the, the relationship is not significant. So, but here we can see that across all 28 countries, um, um, uh, negative emotions have a positive, uh, sorry, uh, a significant negative relationship with mental well-being. So essentially, the more concerned you are, the more, so the, the kinds of um, um, emotions that we measured here were things like anxiety, worry, um, uh, uh, um, feelings of tense about the issue. Um, so it was part of a composite measure of um, uh, state anxiety, basically. And so we see that across all the countries, um, these negative emotions are having an impact on mental well-being. They're, make, they're, they're undermining people's mental well-being. And the countries that are flagged with the um, red um, arrows, they are the three African countries that were included in the study. And that's Nigeria, Tanzania, and Uganda. And you see that even in, in those countries, across those three countries, these negative emotions are linked to um, poor mental well-being. Now, if you move on to the next slide, this now is looking at the link between emotions and pro environmental behavior. So at the individual level, what do you do about um, climate change? You know, the, this ranges from actions like, you know, actions for sustainability at the household level or the degree to which you go out to try to learn more about climate change or that. So some individualized actions. And um, what's really interesting here is so, so as I mentioned earlier, when the line crosses zero, it basically means for for some people, it has no effect. For other people, it has positive effect. Um, for some people, it has a negative effect. But essentially, the, effect, the, the relationship is um, not consistent. And so basically, it's not significant. And we see that for the three African countries, those negative emotions are not leading to pro-environmental behavior. So, um, and then we see the same pattern repeated where the third measure that we looked at was whether or not people had participated in climate protests. So we asked people if, with in the period of a year. So this data were collected in 2019 into 2020. And we asked people if in the period in the in the year leading up to the point when we when they um filled out this questionnaire, if they've been involved in any climate protests. And we see that basically these emotions are generally only linked to um climate protests in like um European democratic affluent countries. So in the three African countries that were included here, the emotions didn't consistently predict um, involvement in climate emotions. Oh, sorry, involvement in uh, climate protests. So basically, as I said earlier, I, 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 I presented this because um, I'm, I'm hoping today not, not just to sit in this position of being the expert and saying, oh, here's what all of this means, but more to kind of enter a 
a, a status of um, discussion with everyone who's present here to kind of join me in trying to make sense of um, what's going on here. So the, 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 the key uh, issue, I guess, is so um, climate action is the sort of most widely advocated sort of antidote for climate anxiety. If you, if, you, if you have this overwhelming negative emotions about climate change, you need to take action in some way around climate change to help you resolve those emotions. Now, there's very limited data on what's going on in Africa, which is part of the reason why I'm so excited about the uh, TEA the T project, because um, there's just very little, we have very little understanding, little insight into how Africans are feeling about the issue and how they're responding to it. But from this limited data that I have, what I can see here is that the negative emotions certainly are, are linked to people, uh, poor well-being and poor mental health but they don't seem to be leading to climate action. So essentially you end up in a situation where people get kind of stuck with the negative impacts of climate anxiety, but they're not really seeming to be able to do anything to address that. And I feel like there is that there is an issue that there is a problem there. So, you know, the, the question for all of us then is, you know, how do we, um, how do we address the situation? How do we um, enable people to take more action on climate change, you know, and at every level? So individually, in collective terms, and how importantly, how do we protect people's mental well-being? How do we bring mental health and well-being to the core of the conversation about climate change uh, in an African context? So I'll stop there for now. And I hope to pick this up again in the question and answer session um, after um, the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles. That was um, super interesting. That was also really very insightful. Um, at this point, okay, I had written something down. It says that action is the most widely advocated antidote to climate um, anxiety. And I completely agree with that because we can see like a couple of youths in Nigeria taking actions towards addressing the issues of um, climate change. And I'm sure that is like one of the ways that we're able to deal with the anxiety that we get to feel. I mean, I was thinking yeah. through it while preparing for today's webinar and I was asking myself, really, how have I been able to, you know, sometimes we get to experience these emotions, but we're not even aware that we are experiencing it, on, on experiencing it rather until we get to read about stuff that relates to it and then we can now put a name to it. So yeah. yes, it is real and then we are very thankful that I mean the conversations are ongoing and we are part of those you know having the conversations and you know um creating awareness about all of this thank you very much and um well like you said we'll have more questions and we would have you also share some more while we have um, um our participants also um, sharing their questions so we could just before we proceed um thank you so much for your presentation once again it was super insightful um so while we um you know, get to call on our second speaker, that's Jennifer Uchendo. I'd like for us to quickly, um, you know, engage online, maybe on our community, your Twitter um, handle, and just let people know that this is ongoing, like the hashtags has been shared, so we can use that. Are we good? Okay. Yeah, so our second speaker this um, evening, I'll just read through her bio very quickly and then she'll you know, come up on the screen. So um, Jennifer Uchendu is a climate activist, sustainability analyst and founder of SustaVibes, a youth-led organization making sustainability relatable and actionable for young people in Nigeria. Jennifer's interest lies in the intersections of women, youth and the environment. And recently she has begun the research and projects related to the experience of eco-anxiety in African populations. Jennifer holds a bachelor's degree in biochemistry for Con from Convenance University and a master's degree in development studies at the Institute of um, Development Studies, oh, okay, England. She's also a 2018 Mandela Washington Fellow, a 2019 Chivlin Scholar, and the co-author of the ebook, A Guide to Business Sustainability in Nigeria. So um, Jennifer, it's so good to have you here and it was really exciting reading your profile. Um, so please, welcome. Thank you so much, Chikwadi. And thanks everyone for joining. And oh my God, Dr. Charles, thank you for that expository slides and data and all of that. I think that's something that has been lacking in this space for a very long time, wanting to know what Africans feel. 
on how to explore those emotions in full. Um, so for me, basically, I, I don't have slides to share for good reasons, because I knew that Dr. Charles would do, you know, justice to the technical side of it. Um, for me, as, you know, the project lead for TIP, and also someone who's experienced eco-anxiety to a very high degree, I thought to share my story and also, you know, some feedback in terms of what I think about understanding eco-anxiety um, generally, and this environmental related emotions. I'll start by talking about my work at Susty Vibes. You know, just as Chikodi read my bio, what we really aim to achieve with Susty Vibes is You're to welcome. make is to make sustainability actionable for young people in Nigeria. And to do that, it means that you're having to work with young people as well, being truly youth led. And you're having to work with young people whose emotions, you know, when we say we're passionate about environmental um, protection, it means that there's emotions attached to it. So we feel some form of, you know, pride when things move, when things don't move and we're stuck up. There's that, you know, apprehension and frustration. And for me, I started to notice that trend in terms of how, you know, our emotions were interacting with generally what we saw in the climate change space, and then even back home to political will and what, you know, the government was doing or not doing about climate action um, locally or in Africa. It just seemed like we were backward and there was so much to be done, you know, to fill in the gap. And with Susty Vibes, I also noticed that it wasn't just me feeling this frustration, it was also the young people I was working with. You know, I was having conversations with people saying, how do you even get to keep on this walk? You know, how are you able to keep coming out to clean up the streets when people pollute it after, you know, when you plant trees, but all the trees are being cut up for, you know, economic gain and whatnot. So it was that, um, that insight for me that just, you know, there was me thinking, and this was in 2018, there has to be some link, you know, with how we feel about, you know, how our emotions interact with climate change. And obviously, as Dr. Charles mentioned, with climate action on the long run. And that's why it's really important that we have this kind of conversations, particularly for us in Africa. We already know that, you know, we're kind of vulnerable because we don't have safety nets to buffer us from the shock of the climate crisis. And with that, when we now sort of slow down on climate action, particularly from young people, then we know that we have a problem with, you know, the future, the political will or what would be for climate action in the next couple of years. And then um, for me, bringing, bringing it back to how it all started for, um, for me, I knew that this, this was an issue and we had started some form of conversation in 2019 to say, okay, let's talk about our emotions. What are we feeling? And it was a very open space. You know, we worked with um, a mental health organization in Nigeria, and then we just wanted to share ideas. And at that time, the name eco-anxiety wasn't something that was known to us. You know, we, we didn't know what it was. We just, you know, we called it climate change and mental health. You know, there's a link here. There's something here, definitely. And it was just a mix of ideas. What are we feeling? You know, people talked about sadness. People talked about hope, that feeling inspired one moment and waking up just really angry and frustrated. And with that, knowing that, that, with that space and that validation that, you know, I wasn't alone in this experience and the, in these emotions, with that came, you know, the need to, I now had to travel to, you know, to, for my master's. And I think in the UK, I became so apart, it was, my equal anxiety became so obvious because I'm like, what is happening here? Who are these people? You know, do they even realize what's happening back home and, and whatnot? And then I think, when I came really close to COP25 in Spain, really close to power and to, you know, so-called world leaders, and to see how sort of patronizing as it were, they, they, they talked about these issues and things like climate finance, you know, it completely blew my mind. I would go back home to my room after COP meetings and just start crying because I'm like, this can't even be real, you know, people are suffering and people are, you know, dying and they keep saying youths have the power to make the change. What power can we possibly have when you have the funds, you have the political will to make change and you keep making excuses. So it's 
in that frustration that I decided to, you know, it was for me it was, do I just give up completely, you know, in this work of climate activism or can I explore, the, explore these emotions and see what it could possibly lead to? And it's in that exploration that I got to know about eco-anxiety and shout out to organizations like Onka, you know, in Brighton that really helped in terms of space and therapy to explore these emotions. And for me, when I found out, you know, that this was a thing, there was something called eco-anxiety. I was so excited reaching out to so many people who had started exploring it. And I said, we need to, we need to explore this. We need to define it. It needs to be validated, particularly for us in Africa. And um, really, that has been my journey to understanding eco-anxiety and even just starting TIP in Nigeria. And really, TIP is for us to scratch. It's just scratching the surface. There's so much questions, so much we need to know, so much you know, interrogation and inquiry into how young people, farmers, frontliners in Africa are feeling about the crisis. Because just as Dr. Charles said, this is not just about mountains and you know polar bears and snow. You know this is about our livelihood. This is people thinking about their health because it's so linked. You know for us in Africa that you can't separate the two from, from each other basically. And um, that has been my um, for me that has been the way I got into this space. And um, really, four major things have helped. You know I talk about therapy a lot because I've had conversations with psychotherapists therapists who are climate aware, who are able to talk about these feelings and validate them and make me know that it's normal that the more you know about the crisis, the more you feel, you know, this form of eco-anxiety or anxiety that comes from, you know, thinking about the climate crisis side by side our future, side by side what you could possibly do as a climate activist and also space, you know, the space we've created with Susty Vibes, the space I, I was able to um, get with Onka just talking about and exploring these emotions and even this virtual space that we are creating by talking about these emotions i think we build a community for hope and strength and i think that's how resilience is formed because you then you don't feel like you're alone in this you know crisis or in this mental um what would i call it this mental prison as it were and um, um the third thing really is research research is so key data is so key we need to gather the right data and that's also one thing we're doing at tip you know with surveys and several conversations to say this amount of people feel this in this way this is what they are thinking and this is how solutions can come up this is how we can you know safeguard or even transform this experience of eco anxiety into something meaningful um, for us so what have i learned from you know this experience of um, managing or learning about eco anxiety um, the very first thing is that these feelings are normal and they are healthy ways of responding to the climate crisis if I knew so much about, you know, climate change and, you know, everything that's happening around us, particularly for Africa, and I didn't feel a form of worry, then something is definitely wrong with me. It means that I'm completely out of touch with reality. And this is not something that, you know, finances would alone would sort. This is, you know, a future crisis. This is economic. You know, someone says climate change just changes everything. By the time you see how linked it is with, you know, migration, security, you know, our food and everything, you then realize that this is a much, much bigger problem. And then that denying it or being numb to it is only going to come back to you, you know, one way or the other. And um, I also have learned that the fact that eco-anxiety has a name, you know, that's been called eco-anxiety, even though it's not all encompassing, and I'll come to that, you know, later, the fact that it's been called something, it's validating, and I, I think that was really useful for me, and even for Susty Vibers, when we realize that this has a name, this can be explored, this can be defined, and this can even be, you know, recategorized, we can say that this is a range of em emotions, and we can can explore, dig into it, and then start to group data, you know, see how, okay, how are women feeling about this? How are young people feeling about this? What spaces and the way we interact with these spaces, how do they um, form to, to make up the experience of eco-anxiety? A good exp um, ex um, example for me was, was with my thesis in the UK, 
where I decided to just explore eco-anxiety and looking at spaces. It was through my thesis I realized that the space of a classroom, the teacher-student you know, student relationship has an impact on how students feel about you know, the climate crisis. Because if your teacher keeps you know, telling you about the 1989 curriculum, oh, climate change is this, this is what's happening. But you read the news every day, you see that things are changing. It's, it's confusing. You know, the family space, do, you, do your families talk about this crisis? Or is it until, you know, it rains and everywhere is flooded that it then becomes a conversation? Even our choices and how we decide to live, you know, it just, just how personal climate change really can be for us, especially when you're exposed to the reality and when you're knowledgeable. That's how you know I realized that these um, experiences are important and we need to know more about them. Um, the third thing is about the range of emotions that that is eco anxiety or climate anxiety. One minute you can feel really hopeful and the next minute you can feel angry and frustrated. One minute you're in denial, you're numb, you're feeling powerless. And then there's also the times where you feel really inspired and you want to act. You want to get as many people together you know, to act. And that is why community is really important because with those levels of emotions, we can support each other. When one person is down with you know, that feeling of powerlessness, the other can be hopeful and say, we can do this. We can you know, come out and do something and just realizing that this is a marathon and not a sprint. And um, finally, it's also that the experience of eco anxiety in Africa is peculiar. You know, it's not the same thing at all. You know, when I researched climate anxiety in the UK, you know, I got emotions like, oh, we're feeling so shameful, you know, about how we live. We feel so guilty. And, you know, I would be like, what are you, you know, I can't relate to this. I'm angry, I'm frustrated, and I feel so helpless. There's no shame in this, you know, for, for us. And it's also ex um, accepting that this range of emotions and these differences are also valid. You know, it just, it goes to show you how power and privilege privilege comes to play in the climate um, uh, change discourse and how, each and every one of us can really push towards solidarity and use you know, our power to support you know, vulnerable voices or oppressed voices in the conversation. And um, also to say that for us in Africa, you know, it's more about our socioeconomic experience. It's more about how do we get our bread you know, and butter as it's where. It's not just about um, you know, snow not falling here and there. It's not just about the weather. It's, more, it's much more meaningful for us. It really impacts us and is a lot more personal. And then finally, to, to properly understand you know, the experience of equal anxiety for Africa, we need Africans, you know, researching this because you, no one else would tell our story for us. No one else would be able to relate to it. And I know a lot of people, uh, we don't want to be, what's the word, patronized for this experience. It really needs to be us saying, you know, as mental health professionals, as climate activists, as climate aware psychotherapists, we need to come together and discuss these issues, open up spaces for conversations, really be, be big and you know crazy about data because that is so important. That's something that I'm looking for every single day. Who are the thinkers within Africa who are looking at this? Who are people that are looking at the curriculum in you know Nigeria, Africa, and saying we need to talk more about the emotional side of the climate crisis because that's how we inspire hope. And hope is so 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 important in this journey because it's so easy to just you know I know um, Shay is on the call. I had read his tweets one day where he said i'm seeing climate activists backslide i'm like it's so easy to backslide because it's really stressful and overwhelming when you think about it and you think about everything that needs to be done and how we can push through and without community communities that are aware and resilient we would really be backsliding and we won't do um we won't we won't be better activists, you know, we'll burn out, we'll be stressed. I've experienced it firsthand. And for me, creating TIP was, okay, how can we now start to talk about this, create advocacy to say, this is normal, this is healthy. 
And these emotions can be safeguarded and transformed into things that are very, very meaningful. It can be anything. It can be starting up more community activations. It can be researching more. It can be even making more, uh, raising more awareness about the interconnectedness of our mental health and you know, the climate crisis. And then advocating for both institutions. I'm so glad today's World, World Health Day. So it's so fitting to talk about how the environment and our health are so linked together as we saw with you know, COVID-19. And for us to push for these conversations, have more synergies between two, the both institutions, and really for young people to be included and involved in the conversation. So yeah, that's it for me. Those are you know, some of my big takeaways in terms of understanding eco-anxiety and even my experience and that journey towards it. And I'm looking forward to the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. I, I mean, I could relate to, thank you for your presentation. It was awesome. I could relate, maybe possibly because I have read a, um, a couple of your write-ups on um, eco-anxiety and, um, you know, just before the call um, began, that's before the session began, I know that I had gone online and I was just, you know, trying to check out the feelings that you get to um, experience. Um, in relation to just the climate, first of all, I was just trying to explore and understand. And then one of the things that stood out for me was that feeling of depression. And I was just able to pick it out. I know that there was a time we had um, we had a conversation at Sustive Vibes. It was, I think it was a virtual conversation. And then people were just, you know, sharing their current um, feeling at the moment. And then you could easily point out that a couple of persons were um, struggling with depression. They were, they, they were scared and then we were able to, you know, find, I mean, link or, or find the connection between what the, um, the environment has brought on to us. Let me use that word. And then how we are trying to, you know, manage, that's the word, manage our emotions in the wave of all of this. And so thank you very much. So now we'll be going on to our um, question and answer session. However, I had also wanted to ask um, some questions, but you addressed one of it and that um, what are those uh, emotions you get to feel? What are those things you get to feel? And that, you, you know, you said the feeling of hopefulness or that people being scared or people being depressed, you know, just you were able to answer that already. So I'm not sure I want us to overflow that, but, but perhaps other persons might want to, you know, get to hear um, what other feelings there might be. So for instance, I could be struggling with depression or I could be, okay, so another one I had them, um, I could relate with is sometimes you feel overwhelmed. So sometimes you're wondering, is it because the, the, the environment is so hot? Is it because, you know, you're trying to push out a message to people and it seems like people are not, you know, trying to understand you. So just yesterday I was, you know, going home and then someone beside me just threw a couple of <laughs> dirt on the street. I wasn't sure what to express to the person because he was just passing by and do that so I just held my I just calmed myself and you know <laughs> just ignored him at that point because there was no way I could reach to him because he was just on the go but well like you said is having you know safe spaces and belonging to community where you can have this conversation and that's you know these things are validated it's normal like let people not feel um think it's not it's not an important concept to discuss until we begin to advocate for this until we begin to spread the message i mean people will really not get to hear about this so thank you so very much um do we have any question here okay i i see someone say um jennifer that was extremely powerful and inspirational inspirational bless you and thank you for your work so thank you so much jennifer um okay i have a couple of questions here and i think i want to um, direct it so i'm a psychologist on this very session so yes so i will just be reading out the question um and uh, well jennifer if you also want to make an input that's absolutely fine but i think he might be in the best position to answer this so I, my question would be that um can eco anxiety be described as a mental disorder and does it require serious medical attention? Thank you. That, that's a really good question. That's one, I mean, I would say that's probably one of the questions that comes up the most often in relation to eco anxiety and clumsy anxiety and things like that. So, the first, you know, categorical response is that eco anxiety or clumsy anxiety are not disorders. 
Um, I think it's really important to emphasize the fact that, uh, you know, as Jennifer, Jennifer absolutely nailed it there, saying, if you're not worried, if you're not anxious, you know, if you, if you, if you, it's either you don't truly really understand the magnitude of the problem, or actually the lack of anxiety is the disorder because you're, you're seeing the reality of what is an absolutely awful situation and somehow your natural, you know, normal responses are not kicking in to tell you that this is something you need to be doing something about. So remember, as I said earlier, that, you know, the, the function of these emotions is to kind of direct us at things that are potentially threatening to us and kind of give us that motivation to, 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 to act, to neutralize them, to, to, to remove that source of threat. So, you know, we've, we've, we've evolved these emotions that kept us alive from generation to generation. And that's what's kicking in with regulations of climate change. So you're encountering all this information, you're developing this understanding of what's going on in the world and what the implications are. Um, and so naturally you need to, uh, 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 th this anxiety response is need to kick in. So in that sense, um, eco anxiety is not a disorder, but there is a degree to which you know, eco anxiety can occur at a level that it then has clinical implications. You know, so like I was saying, when you get to the point where you are, you're literally unable to sleep, you're literally unable to function in your job or in your family or you know your social relations and things like that, then it begins to you know edge to then then it has clinical implications. Then we might think of approaching it from uh, a perspective of. Um, um, you know, we're treated like a disorder. But the thing about um, any kind, you know, that's also um, worth bearing in mind when we think about, um, you know, those clinically significant manifestations of eco-anxiety is that ultimately eco-anxiety is just a manifestation of a problem. So it's, it's like someone who's got malaria who's taking paracetamol. Yes, okay, maybe it'll relieve the, the headache, but the actual parasite that is causing you the illness is not going anywhere. So even if you give people skills to kind of minimize the effect of eco anxiety so they can just carry on in their normal life like nothing is happening, well, the climate change problem is still there, you know, and just the, all those negative impacts that are coming as a consequence of that will still continue to take place. So it's not a very, um, uh, well, so it's not a very constructive, um, um, you know, uh, uh, frame for eco anxiety to kind of think about it from that perspective of being a disorder, except for situations where you have this really extreme responses that need to be managed just you know, for people to function um, um, normally. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles. Thank you for um, giving us the clarity. I mean, some persons have also asked me if eco-anxiety was a medical disorder, and I was trying to give the explanation. And I also wanted also to be sure that the um, response I had given to, to them was actually correct, because in all of what I have searched out on the internet, I, I, there was never a place that it was mentioned that it was a medical disorder. So I just wanted to hear directly from a psychologist. And then um, it's good that every one of us here has also heard that it's not a medical, um, it's not a medical disorder. Yes, but I mean, it's something that we should all be very much aware of and um, take caution to. Yes, thank you. So um, Lequa has his hands up. So Lequa, yes, the floor is yours. You can, you know, ask your question. You can unmute and ask your question, please. Thank you, Chikori. Um, also, thank you to Dr. Charles and Jennifer also. Um, the, the question that I want to ask is, um, you know, for people who are, simply, I mean, simply just is, is another statement, but for people who are very overwhelmed by, by the issue and who are just filled with pent up emotions about, about climate anxiety, you know, like, what do you say to them? Because I, as I understand, because I, I, I understand climate change, and I understand the climate anxiety they are feeling to be as a result of several, 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 several things, maybe from climate justice, from the impact they're experiencing. So all of these things have layered, layer, have layered emotions on, on them. So like it's, 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 it's different to talk about or to, to discuss climate anxiety to the person when you, are, you only understand the person to have one symptom or, what, or one experience of anxiety, you know? So like if there are layers of anxiety where, where, where the person has, how do you explain to the person or rather how do you talk to the person about it? Um, I'll just say that, that that's a really good question. Thank you very much. And I, I think um, very simply, um, it's still kind of, I'll circle back to action is always what I would say is the way to go because, um, so 
the, the quite a few things that came up that as Jennifer was speaking, I was thinking, oh, this is really brilliant. So it'll, it'll, it'll be really good to kind of highlight that and come to that. Because usually when people think about equal anxiety, I and mean, even if you look at, for example, the image that I used on that slide where I talk about climate anxiety, that is your stereotypical representation of what happens. Everyone just thinks, you know, anxiety is like just paralysis and you're just like overwhelmed. And you just, I mean, that is a part of it, but that is only a subset. Um, and one of the dimensions of the sort of equal anxiety that I think um, people maybe struggle to identify it as what it is, is the anger aspect of it. Um, and I, I would say from my personal experience, that's the bit that really relates for me, because um, I feel like in the in the in the trajectory of my life, I kind of felt like, oh, you know, you 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 go along with this idea of you know, you're trying to work and you're trying to sort of better yourself and you're trying to you're hoping that there's this future out there where things will be better than where you are right now. And then with climate change, what happens is you get to that point and then that future just doesn't exist. And it's just kind of like, it's just bad news. It's just now, you know, the things, the time when you thought, okay, now I can kind of relax, I can do it. It's like, no, actually you can't do that because that that's all gone. It's no longer acceptable because, you know, of the impact of, because now those privileges that were afforded to people before you are no longer available. And so you feel a sense of betrayal and with that comes anger as well. And also when you are aware of, you know, the, the, the thing that's also really, important with climate change in general is also we really need to be aware of the global context of it there's no there's no point trying to add, um, address in the localized sense of i want to do something in in, in nigeria or in lagos or whatever you need to kind of understand the interconnections with the global um uh, um the, the global context of it and i think that potentially is the place we really need to drive on for people. Um, so one concept that has been very um, interesting to me, and I'm really hoping to hear more about that as well, is this idea of climate justice. It's a very good framework for thinking about how we need to be acting about this. It's, you know, that the, the, we, we, the, there's this imbalance, even in the solutions, the so-called solutions, if you read, you know, all the information that's coming out of the IPCC, what all the um, so Western nations are saying, you know, it's almost like it's an afterthought, like Africans are just in this role of, well, you guys are exposed to all the bad stuff. And, you know, it, we become some kind of a, an instrument for, you know, trying to uh, make moral arguments, say, oh, look, you know, we've got to, and it's, it's it, 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 that also links to the other thing that, that was very salient for me was maybe just talking about, you know, so telling our own stories and things like that. You know, it's this, this, whatever feelings are feeling, they um, depression, be it anxiety, be it anger and all that, we need to be finding a way to sort of channel it to, you know, the solution is in redressing that imbalance. The solution is demanding, you know, th this is not something that is some kind of privilege that some other agent out there is going to give to us. This is something that is ours. This is our rights that we need to start to demand. And I think that that is one way in which we can really start to tackle this issue of um, equal anxiety, because when you start to think about it like that, it puts you in a, in, a, in, a, in a position of power, in a position where action is possible, in a position where change is possible. When you think about it more in terms of there is some kind of natural process that's going on out, the carbon emissions, or we need to cut back up emissions, et cetera, it doesn't really make you feel powerful because it feels too much like, oh, it's just so much, so complicated. What am I going to do? And that's the thing that leads to depression. But when you put it more in terms of, you know, the, 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 the injustices that have, that have been occurring over time that need to be corrected, and we are, we are part of a larger movement of people that are recognizing that and are taking action to try to redress that imbalance. Then all of a sudden, we are all powerful agents. Every single one of us has a role to play in redressing that imbalance. And so I feel like that is one way that, irrespective of where you are on the spectrum of equal anxiety, that is one way in which you can kind of channel that whole complex of emotions into something that will have a positive impact. O overall, we'll put you in a place where you're, you're able to, you're healthier, you know, you're able to kind of function positively on a sort of emotional, psychic, you know, sort of level. So that, that, that's kind of my reflection on, on, on that question. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, Lefa, does um, that address your question? Um, so, sort of, but I was, I was kind of like, you know, um, directing it or pointing out the fact that there's some people that have layers of, of emotions when it comes to climate anxiety, you know, and, and if there's anything you'd say to them, but I understand that you talked about, you know, you know, uh, taking action because that's, that's also very, very good for, um, for remedying, um, anxiety, climate anxiety that we feel sometimes. Okay. Sorry, sorry, just to clarify about the layers of emotions, my understanding of that is that people kind of cycle through different kinds of emotions. So, you know, on one level, you might feel 
depressed on another level you might feel angry on another level you might feel just generally anxious on one level you might feel kind of powerless is is that is that is that i mean can you can you maybe clarify what you mean by the layers yes, of emotions exactly, that people might feel? okay uh yeah so exactly so that, that's what i mean I, I i feel basically i think where the layer thing comes in is this idea that on one hand you can feel inspired today tomorrow you might feel just completely disillusioned and things like that but i'm saying you know when we when we expand our understanding and our engagement with climate anxiety and climate change we can kind of try to position ourselves in a position in, in a state where we always feel like there is something i can do there is a way in which i can be an active powerful agent in this story rather than just someone who's just like kind of helpless and just they've been swept along in something really complex uh, so i feel like that that can cut through those layers of the i mean naturally you're going to cycle from one to another but in terms of just minimizing the degree or the likelihood to which it's uh, might have, say, for example, a, a negative impact on your mental health. Being in that active position, that active uh, perspective on it, I think is protective in itself. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, at this point, so we don't get to drag on the times and um, you know, every other person can proceed. Yes, I, can we take just one more question? And when we have this in the chat box, um, then we'll wrap up um, this session this evening. So um, we have from, so I'm throwing this question to either of the speakers. Anyone can take it up and, you know, address it. So we have a question from Charmaine. I hope I got that correctly. So um, here she says, do you think African nations are afraid of their own emotions because of the view that other nations will see them as weak? And do you think this is connected to generational trauma? Hmm. So who is going to um I don't I don't want to hug this um session because I actually really want to hear from Jennifer, but I will just speak very quickly. Um and um I really want to hear what you have to say about this as well. Um the, the, my my view on what Af what Africans feel about their emotions. I think it would probably be hasty to say that Africans are um, afraid of their own emotions because we've never had a chance before now to even say anything about how we feel. So I, I, I would I would hesitate to make a judgment like that. But I do think to an extent, yes, there are layers of generational trauma. I mean, our our, our societies have been ravaged by colonialism, by slavery, by all the impacts over the years. And whether we're aware of it or not, it's kind of baked in into the way we relate to one another, the way we understand the world today. It's there. And again, this is another really good thing about forums like this that I find really exciting because we can really explore this thing. We can really, we can really begin to identify them. We can really begin. To, I mean, eco anxiety in a way is a concept that's been given to us. But what I'm really excited about is a future where we're beginning to develop our own concepts. We're really about identifying things that are unique to us because there are lots of complexities and lots of issues that are very particular to the African context. That if you're not an African, you just can't really relate to it. And right now, the sort of scientific agenda, the policy agenda is so dominated by a Western, um, sort of Western centric focus that we haven't even had the opportunity to explore those things. We haven't had opportunities to even make sense of what it means to exist on this planet at this time as an African until now. So for me, I see it more of that, yeah, definitely there is the histories of generational trauma that we need to unravel, we need to make sense of, we need to heal from. But I also see that there is a, there's a future ahead where, it, to me, it's really exciting because the more we get this understanding, the more we're able to, you know, make the right decisions. We are empowered. You know, we can we we can demand what we want. We can make the right. Uh, you know, e even when options are presented to us, we're better able to judge what's actually in our best interest. Which I think before now we really haven't been able to do that. Um, so so I think I think I, I I I don't I don't have any feeling at all that African nations are weak. If anything, I would say African nations have been weakened by external forces. It's not that there is some kind of inbuilt thing that makes us kind of weaker, or there's something about oh, we're not stunted in our our emotional, you know, uh, existence or anything like that. It's just that we've been in a framework that has actively, you know, tried to disempower us, has actively kind of uh, deprived us of the ability to have these conversations to engage with these issues so this, so for me this is this is like a this is like a dawn of a new horizon and uh, when i said earlier at the start of the meeting i feel really optimistic that's kind of where the optimism comes from it kind of makes me feel like actually change is happening yes there's climate change happening it's a big problem and we're going to deal with that but 
the, 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 what's happening within our African circles, it's good because you know it's 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 positive change and a positive trajectory where we're finally kind of taking the reins and taking control and shaping our own destiny, and and that's really exciting. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Charmaine has, I think she has a follow up, or he or she has a follow up question. Okay, so I. I we're we'll, we'll very quick about it so we can wrap up the session please well please you can go ahead to speak on mute and um yeah we get to know if you're male or female charming okay hi sorry i wasn't sure if you were asking me um sorry what was your question Okay, I had seen you raise your hand, so I thought you had a follow-up question. Oh, no, 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 um, you answered my question. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was um, okay, that's very fine. Cool, You're welcome. Um, for provoking, yes. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much. And um, thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, um, Dr. Charles, or Charles, as you um, prefer to be addressed. Thank you. <laughs> Please call me Charles. <laughs> that that, that, right, that then, Charles. Was given to me. <laughs> I'm quite happy to be called Charles. Yes, thank you. Um, so our participants, please let us know if you picked a thing or two from this um conversation today. So, like we had shared the um the hashtags is um sustainorm tip webinar series um eco anxiety so let's just go ahead and tweet and just let people know what we took home from today so um i think i penned a couple of things down so um just randomly i'll say that one of the things that we should be going home with or just to retreat is that it's healthy it's normal to have this conversation it's normal to feel this way and um one of the speakers had also said that it's okay to um belong to safe spaces and communities like belong to groups where when you have this conversation it doesn't seem like you're speaking greek or any language that is not so familiar yes so that's one of the things we can do and then um, another one um dr charles charles had mentioned he said that um um one of the ways we have been able to de deal with this is um through um the most popular ways is by advocating so it's good that we you know continue with this i mean you don't get wrong with advocating for something that is quite um, new or strange and you know creating that awareness so um that would be all from my end i'd also included the link to the eco anxiety in nigeria survey so we are i'm trying to call them um, collect data on um just equal anxiety. So please, the link has been shared on the chat. Do well to click on the link and then um, just help us in our research process so that we can collect enough data as we have this conversation and drive it further. Yes. Um, so, well, this brings us to um, the very last lap of today's um, very session of um, equal anxiety webinar series, the very first of its kind. I'm super excited excited that I was a part of it and I was able to moderate the session and yes there's a lot of take home from it and somehow we have been enlightened and we have better information and understanding about all of what we are trying to embark on as a project yes yeah, so um on to next time I'm sure that the date for the next webinar series will be announced on our social media platforms and also in our communities and I'm sure it's also going to be in our newsletter so um, be on the lookout for um the next um, webinar series the date and um the platform, well, I'm sure it's also going to be virtual. So thank you all so very much. And um, please, you can unmute and say hi, bye. It was a nice session. It was this, it was that. And then we'll just wrap up. But that will be all from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, um, Charles. Thank it, you. Was, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was really thank so great. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. And I'm just so glad I joined. Thank you yeah, very much. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> thank you, Chikari. Yes, yes. thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Right. Bye. You have a good evening. Bye.